calls out the anti-ADOS rhetoric, right? I saw somebody, and I, I point this out before, like, oh, you're the top slave, right? Like, you know, when people call us, when we found out that they were calling us Akata, which means wildcat, and they were using that specifically and talking about ADOS. So you have to also understand that there has been some specific kind of anti-ADOS rhetoric. Part of the problem that happens- Welcome to The Awakening. Black Women United, I am your host, Sherry Danny. Watch this video until the end. Subscribe, like, share, comment, and hit the notification bell so you know every time I upload a new video. How's everyone doing today? I hope you're all ready for a deep dive into something that's been on a lot of our minds lately. The diaspora war between Africans, Caribbeans, and Black Americans. In my opinion, the diaspora war is not going anywhere anytime some soon. And think about going there. there. And I heard it's a beautiful place. Yeah. And I know it's the motherland. Yes. But not my mother, not her mother, and not her mother's mother. That ain't their land. America's real true land is right here in the U.S. soil. Everybody else walk around happy and free, and they looking at us self-destruct. What we have to do right now, we have to get our shit together and stay out their motherfucking way and let them each other. Yeah, let them motherfucking another. And I don't know about all y'all people that voted for Trump, all y'all other racists. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that. All y'all other I'm trying to figure out how Afro get in front of my motherfucking race. I ain't never been to Afro color. I never been to Africa. Afro or Afro color. Never been there. I'm not from Africa. I'm born and raised in Goose, Florida. I'm a born and Goose, raised in Liberty City, the Polka Bean Project. I ain't never went to Africa. I ain't think about going there. And I heard it's a beautiful place. Yeah. And I know it's the motherland. Yes. But not my mother, not her mother, and not her mother's mother. That ain't their land. America, real true land is right here in the U.S. soil. Soon, and you will see what I mean when you see the clips. To me, the diaspora war is about power. The fact that several African nations sold imprisoned and aided Western European nations in the transatlantic slave trade and have not offered to repair the descendants and the African chiefs were fully aware of what they were doing. Welcome to The Awakening. Black Women United. I am your host, Sherry Donnie. Subscribe, like, share, comment, and hit the notification bell so you know every time I upload a new video. African Woman says African nations owe African Americans reparations and are just as guilty and violent as were the white Europeans. She wants to know why only Europeans are shamed for the transatlantic slave trade and the brutality of slavery, but not the Africans. Umar Johnson and other African-American Pan-Africanists have minimized Africa's brutal role in the slave trade, saying they did not know it would be as horrific as it was. However, in the clips, I will show they were fully aware and did not care. Umar Johnson, African, who has taken the time to educate herself on the topic of slave trade that happened, especially in the West Coast of Africa centuries ago, I strongly hold the opinion that continental Africans should pay reparations to Descendants of enslaved Africans who now live in the Caribbean, in the Americas, and in Europe. Because the slave trade that happened on the continent was a transaction between the Europeans and the Africans who participated in that atrocious trade. They were doing. Currently, some Black Americans have moved to some African nations and have not received a warm welcome from African governments and some have been deleted, especially in the Gambia. Currently, America is the most powerful nation on the planet, and Black Americas made it powerful with their ancestors' free labor during slavery sharecropping of Jim Crow and Black entertainment in America. Hip-hop is one of the most popular genres of music in the United States and is a major influence on culture and the economy. Economic impact. Hip-hop contributes over $15 billion to the U.S. economy annually through music sales, merchandise, and concert revenue. Cultural influence. Hip hop is a major influence on culture, and its popularity has led to more business with black owned media. For example, ad spend with top black owned radio stations increased 92% in 2022. Streaming hip hop is one of the most listened to genres on Spotify, with over 400 million users streaming hip hop in 2023. TV programming. Hip-hop programming on TV is one of the most representative for black talent on screen, 
with about two out of three black viewers. Black Americans are fighting for power, reparations, wealth employment, and so on, and are not about to allow immigrants, including African and Caribbean distant relative immigrants, stand in their way of getting what the United States owes them. They paved the way for many black immigrants to come to the U.S., and some within these same groups have joined white Americans against them. We call black ourselves Ameri African Americans. Why do you think there was that, that push for us to try to trace back our roots? And, and why do you think that kind of has, in some ways, that's kind of disappeared from what I've seen? I think part of that is psychological. Honestly, I'm just, just going to be honest with you. I think, I think America has been so hard for us that we romanticize Africa and we say, oh, if I was just in Africa, everything would be okay. I would be with my brothers and sisters. And we don't even really understand like a lot of their struggles, a lot of what they go through, that it's not, it's not this utopia of, of, of all of us just get along. You have a lot of African countries that get, don't get along with each other, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's psychological in a certain, to a certain extent. We really have a hard time in America, how we're seen in America. And part of the way we have dealt with that is a form of escapism where we feel like everything would be better if I were in Africa and here's my dashiki and I'm African. And it takes us out. To me, I have a problem with that too, because it takes us out of the fight because I believe we have to fight here. We have to fight for what we're all, we have to fight for our agenda, right? We have to fight for our politics. We have to fight for our policy. We have to fight for resources. So I think that kind of, I, I think that was a form of escapism. It was a psychological form of escapism where we felt we didn't feel so, people have made us feel so lost. This idea of loss, we're lost. We're, we're Africans in America. We ain't supposed to be here. We're a lost tribe. And I think now we're coming to the term, coming to terms with we're American. I don't care how you feel about it. I don't care. We can, we can dislike all of the policies. We can dislike imperialism. And I do. We can dislike America's domestic policy that doesn't make you any less American. And if you want this country to be better, you have to have a political fight with the people who run this country. And I think we're coming to terms with that. And a lot of people are uncomfortable about that. So that brings me to the point about uh, imperialism, because uh, obviously, as you're aware, the war in Gaza is receiving a, a lot of attention. Lot of I've discussed it a lot on this show. I, I would actually them. refer to Black Americans now say no more and want all immigrants out and agree with President Donald Trump on removing birthright citizenship. Most Black Americans can trace their ancestry to the middle 1800s and earlier in America. I myself can trace my ancestry thus far to 1785 through census records, along with birth certificates and death records, also plantation records, slave cemeteries, and bill of sales. Some Black Americans have mistreated Black immigrants as well. Today, we're diving into a topic that's messy, complicated, and hits close to home for many of us, diaspora wars. This isn't just any ordinary discussion, it's one that involves our identities, our histories, and our futures. Yeah, you heard that right, Wars. But hold up, before you picture spears and shields, know that these battles are fought with words, stereotypes, and sadly, a whole lot of ignorance. These are the kind of wars that leave emotional scars and create divides where there should be unity. We're talking about the tension, the misconceptions, and sometimes straight up beef between Africans, Caribbeans, and African Americans. It's a complex web of misunderstandings and historical baggage that we need to untangle. It's like that awkward family reunion where everyone's arguing over who makes the best potato salad. But instead of potatoes, it's about history, culture, and who had it worse. Imagine the tension when everyone brings their own version of the story to the table. Now I'm not here to take sides or throw shade. This isn't about pointing fingers or blaming anyone. It's about understanding where these feelings come from and how we can move past them. My goal is to break this down, expose the roots of this conflict, and hopefully help us all understand each other a little better. Email and um, shit. Let me let me tell y'all a quick story before we get into this show tonight. Um, I had somebody come into my email. I had a couple of somebody's, but one of y'all left me like five paragraphs, and y'all have emailed me like three times in the day. Um, apparently, it is a woman who is black, but she is a immigrant black woman, and she said that she used to like me, but now she don't like me because I don't care nothing about the immigration situation. She was mad that I don't believe in Jesus. She called me a bunch of bitches, which is ironic because bitch, I thought you was a Christian. Is you talking crazy to me like this? I can't cuss, but bitch, you cussing me like this is the hypocritical shit I'm talking about. She told me 
Bitch, I used to have sympathy for you. I don't have no sympathy for your motherfucking son. Y'all some criminals, but y'all get to be in the country. Bitch, this is my country. What the fuck is you talking about? This ain't your country. But I want to make a better point to y'all. This is what the fuck I mean when I say that we don't have no allies. And I'm talking to ADOS, Black people who are from America. Okay? Your ancestors birthed this motherfucking country. That's who I'm talking to right now. Not no Pan-African shit. This is what the fuck I mean when I tell you we don't have no allies. Because as soon as you say some shit that they don't agree with, they show you how they really fucking feel about you. Because I think it's crazy that whether this lady is an immigrant or not, she said she's been here since she was a kid. I'm sure you will be fine and you're not going to be deported. But the fact that this bitch can't motherfucking understand that as black Americans, but you claim you down for us, you don't have any understanding of how the immigrant situation is fucking up our communities first and foremost. You don't give a fuck about what black people are dealing with in their community. We already got gangs and now gangs is fighting with Venezuelan gangs. What about all the black people that get caught up in the midst of that shit? Y'all seem to act like the fucking black immigrants don't get no motherfucking benefits. I could have sworn it was the Haitians that they said was eating the dogs and eating the cats. Now, I don't know if they were doing that, but what the fuck they was doing with their immigrant black asses was driving cars and crashing into everybody because they don't even know how to fucking drive over here. They was doing that. And they're over there with places to stay. They're getting all the jobs. They're overtaking people's town. So we're not going to act like when you black and you an immigrant that you don't even look down on American black folks and that you don't get benefits too because you do. But oh, you want to all of a sudden be allies when you think, when you get here and you realize you a nigga too. So when the police fuck with you because you black, now you want, you want us to come together and march for you. Oh, you want us to fight for you because now we're all black but the moment I say some shit that just affects us now you're offended now I gotta be a bitch now you have no sympathy for me motherfucker you never did give a fuck about me that's why it's so easy for you to get mad as soon as I say something that's why I tell y'all if the shoe fit wear it put the bitch on tie to walk around in that motherfucker to do 12 laps in that bitch matter of fact if you an immigrant no matter of your race tie them shoes up and walk your ass back the fuck to your country a little you better we need to look at the historical context, the socioeconomic factors, and the personal experiences that shape our perspectives. So buckle up, fam. It's going to be a bumpy but necessary ride. We're going to explore the roots of these conflicts, hear from people who have lived through them, and hopefully come out the other side with a better understanding of each other. Let's get into it. To understand the diaspora wars, we got to rewind way back. We're talking centuries ago, to a time when the world was a very different place. Picture this, the 16th century, a time of exploration, conquest, and unfortunately, exploitation. European ships are crisscrossing the Atlantic, not for vacation, but for a horrific business, the transatlantic slave trade. These ships weren't just vessels, they were floating prisons. Millions of Africans were ripped from their homes, shackled, and shipped across the ocean. Families were torn apart, cultures disrupted, and lives forever changed. This forced migration, this horrific chapter in human history, is where our story begins. It's a story of pain, but also of resilience and survival. Africans landed in the Caribbean, toiling on sugar plantations, and in North America, picking cotton under the blazing sun. They were forced into backbreaking labor, day in and day out. Same oppression, different masters, different flavors of colonialism. The Caribbean had its sugar barons, while North America had its cotton kings. The first enslaved Africans arrived in the continental United States in 1526. Now I'm not saying our experiences were identical. Each region had its own unique set of horrors and challenges. The brutality of slavery varied from place to place. Some faced harsher physical punishments, while others endured psychological torment. But the point is, we were all victims of the same system, a system designed to dehumanize and exploit us. This system was built on the backs of our ancestors and its legacy still affects us today. And that shared experience is crucial to understanding who we are today. We've come a long way since those dark days. Our ancestors' strength and resilience have paved the way for us to achieve great things. 
We honor their legacy by continuing to fight for justice and equality. So as we move forward, let's remember where we came from. Let's honor our roots and celebrate our shared history. Because in understanding our past, we find the strength to shape our future. Fast forward a few centuries and look at us now. A beautiful tapestry of cultures, languages, and traditions. African Americans with their soul food and jazz. Caribbeans with reggae and jerk chicken. And Africans with their diverse languages and vibrant clothing. Yeah, we got our differences in accents, food, music, even the way we dance. But those differences come from centuries of adapting, surviving, and thriving in different corners of the world. Section 4, African Bootstraps versus Welfare Queens Unpacking Stereotypes. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room stereotypes, those nasty little boxes people try to put us in. Africans are backwards or tribal. Caribbean nations such as Haiti are unstable politically, and African Americans? Oh, they're lazy, angry, and always on welfare. Amen. These stereotypes... Uh, and, and, I would say that. Some immigrants are too. That's why we ain't gonna foot the bill for them. And, and many immigrants are too. They're too lazy to build their own homes, and it ain't our job to foot the bill. When we're lazy, ain't nobody footing our damn bill, so ain't nobody gonna foot their bill either. Let them go home, right? I just don't agree with that. I, I just don't feel... They do the same in their homeland, ma'am. Why do we have to sit here and be the sacrifice? Because everybody don't get that same opportunity everywhere. You create it. That's what I did. You create the... And sometimes it's not that simple. It's very simple. It ain't that it was well, it's, it's hard because it, it was hard for us to create the little opportunities that we've had, but we don't deserve to have people flooded on all over us getting benefits that we fought for. Every time we fight for something, they run and leapfrog over us to get it. We had enough of that. And then they're ungrateful on top of it. They turn around and then turn on us. Damn that. Those days are over. Are you just saying just for the immigrants or just people? That come over here specifically. Uh, anybody, anybody, immigrants included, we ain't capable. I think you're really getting the wrong message, Tyree, to the American people <laughs> that you know. That uh, Brittany, on your platform, Brittany, Brittany. There's a reason why this country damn near flip red all across the board. Why do you think this country flip red, basically? Huh? <sighs> I, I, that Come on. I think Come on now. is because of the simple fact Biden, I mean, just hear me out. Biden had just took a loss. People really was going for Biden. And then they just put Kamala in it with those hundred days. That's the, I think that's the reason why she kind of failed and she didn't win because of the simple fact of the time. Man. That woman had enough time and resources. They gave the... Tony had 100 days. And... So, look at this. If you had a campaign for 100 days... Ma'am, they gave that woman billions of dollars. They sat here and propped her up in the media. They sat her next to every A-list celebrity. Oprah, Beyonce, um, um, Taylor Swift, J-Lo... Eminem, I mean, they rolled the red carpet and the country said, hell no. What does that say? I think people was just afraid. Of what? Of of what? The economy, because of the economy right now. That's what I think. They're afraid of what, dear? Because of the economy, how everything is just so super high right now. Right, and that's because... That's why I think Trump won. And that's because of the... That's be, and the immigrants in part due to that, because... They the high. No, I wouldn't say the immigration. Yeah, because all that. a lot of our resources are going to them. They're coming over here, and our tax. But what's our, wrong with helping other people our, out? Man, we got to help out. What's wrong with helping ourselves? We got to help us. I want foundational Black Americans to be good. But they are good. No, not enough. There's too many of us are suffering. I want all of us. I, I well, some foundation Black American people are very lazy. Oh, and, and I would say that some immigrants are too. That's why we ain't gonna foot the bill for them. And and many immigrants are too. They're too lazy to build their own homes, and it ain't our job to foot the bill. When we're lazy, ain't nobody footing our damn bill. So ain't nobody gonna foot their bill either. Let them go home, right? 
I just don't agree with that. I, I just on welfare. Don't feel- These stereotypes are not only inaccurate and offensive, but they also fuel the diaspora wars. They create this false sense of superiority and resentment, pitting us against each other instead of recognizing our shared history and struggles. It's time to dismantle these harmful narratives and understand that we're not a monolith. Within each group, there's a spectrum of experiences, beliefs, and values. So let's ditch the stereotypes and embrace the richness and diversity within our communities. Section five, media's distortion, fanning the flames of division. Now let's talk about the media, shall we? The media in all its forms holds an immense power over our perceptions and beliefs. It has the ability to shape narratives, influence opinions, and even alter the course of history. But with great power comes great responsibility. That powerful tool that can either educate or misinform, unite or divide. The media can be a beacon of truth, shedding light on important issues and bringing communities together. Or it can be a source of division, spreading misinformation and perpetuating harmful stereotypes. Like you say, I can't control Twitter, but I can control our agenda. And that black agenda and its suite of anti-discrimination that we call for and all that sort of thing, that extends to no matter who your lineage is. It's just reparations. So I can't, I cannot control that. But what one thing I would actually say though, too, is people always call out um the ant the, the the what they deem to be xenophobic. Nobody usually calls out the anti-ADOS rhetoric, right? I saw somebody and I, I point this out before, like, oh, you're the top slave, right? Like, you know, when people call us, when we found out that they were calling us Akata, which means wild cat, and they were using that specifically and talking about ADOS. So you have to also understand that there has been some specific kind of anti-ADOS rhetoric. Part of the problem that happens, and I'm not just talking about black immigrants here, I'm extending it out. You can talk about when the Irish became white or whatever. A lot of people kind of integrate into this anti-ADOS posture um, because they want to assimilate into whiteness. And assimilating into that kind of whiteness usually means assimilating into some of the ideas of white supremacy, which means that these people just don't work hard enough, they're lazy, whatever. So we see some of that as well. Now, I the, the tether thing goes to another group. I don't really get involved with that. We didn't make it up. We don't use, use it. But what I'm saying is that these little spats and fights, they don't always start with us. They, you know, there are people who have decided for a long time that it's their job to define ADOS, that they get to say who we are. If we say, hey, we're American, they get to say you're African. You're stupid. You don't know. Oh, where's your family from? You don't even know where your people come from. Well, my people are here. I can tell you my grandma, my grandma, whatever. my people are here. So there are a lot of people online who try to diminish us as well. And that results in all kinds of fights and name calling because it's Twitter. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Even for me personally, I've had uh, other groups tell me that I don't have any culture because I'm a black <laughs> American. There you go. That I, I have no culture. I don't know my real language. You know, things like this. And I wonder where does that come from? Why do these things happen? Like, for example, I live right outside of Boston. Boston, similar to, I would say, New York. People kind of have their own communities. So different immigrant groups have their own communities. And what I have noticed, whether it was New York or Boston, for the most part, I think people think that all of us are like a monolith. And that is not the case. There are certain neighborhoods that you can go to in Boston that are Dominican. There are certain neighborhoods that you go to that are Haitian. There are certain neighborhoods you go to that are Caribbean. But I think people, they just see the skin color and they think we're all aligned together or we're all in community together. And that's not the case. Where do you think that mindset comes from that when you come to this country, for whatever reason, you're told these are some of the things that were said to me by friends of mine that immigrated here is that they were told not to uh, coalesce with black Americans. Where does that come from and why does that happen? I think when people come here, they come here to to be a part of the winning team and we're not the winning team. We are the oppressed people in this country. So I think that's part of where it comes from. And I think people have, you know, kind of taken advantage of our belief that we're lost somewhere. Right. You have people say I'm an African-American. I'm a lot of things. I may be, you know, I'm a lot of things. We're an amalgamation. I always say we're descendants of slaves and slave masters. I'm a lot of things. You don't get to tell me who I am. I'm a particular amalgamation. I'm a particular mix of whatever. America has a really interesting history in terms of immigration, white immigration, black, you know, uh, uh, ADOS. We have a particular. So I think there has been this thing that we've allowed for a very long time where people 
people, we have allowed people to define us and tell us who we are. And there's a lot of there is a lot of pushback when we say, hold on, pump your brakes. We have agency here. We have an opportunity here to define ourselves and tell you who we are. And you don't get to define us. As a matter of fact, we know our culture. As a matter of fact, a lot of people around the world go around adopting our culture and we create a lot of cool. And then you want to come and tell us we don't have a culture. And that sort of thing is offensive. So when you say that to people and we have a particular culture in America, we have something that we built. We have something that we survived in this country that allowed you to be here. That is offensive. And I think you see a lot of fights. I think you see a lot of name calling on both sides. And I think yeah. you just have to be honest that it comes from both sides. It's not just us shooting darts at types. And sadly, when it comes to the diaspora, the media often chooses the latter. Think about it. How often do we see stories that celebrate the richness and diversity of our communities? Rarely. Instead, the focus is often on conflict, crime, and poverty. How often do you see positive and nuanced representations of our communities in mainstream media? Yeah, not so much. The stories that do make it to the headlines are often sensationalized, stripped of context, and designed to provoke fear or outrage. Instead, we get bombarded with the same tired tropes and stereotypes. The thuggish black man, the sassy black woman, the poverty-stricken African child. These images are not just inaccurate, they are harmful. They reduce complex human beings to one-dimensional caricatures. This lack of representation, this constant barrage of negativity, distorts the way we see ourselves and each other. It creates a distorted mirror, reflecting back a skewed version of reality that can be damaging to our self-esteem and our sense of identity. It reinforces those harmful stereotypes and fuels the flames of the diaspora wars. When people are constantly exposed to negative portrayals of their own communities, it can lead to internalized racism and division within the diaspora itself. To me, the diaspora wars began when Black Americans began to delineate from the African diaspora and are fighting for reparations for slavery and Jim Crow. Now some Africans and Caribbeans either want to be included in the payments or say that African Americans who now want to be called American descendants of slavery, ADOS or foundational Black American FBA, or simply Black Americans, it is true that Black Americans or Adas had an ethnogenesis in the United States because they are a not African. They have African ancestry mixed with 20% and higher of American Indian and European ancestry. Black Americans have been in America since 1526, built the nation with free labor and locked out of inherited wealth. With the Trump 2024 election, we see that many Black Americans are against mass illegal immigration, and at this point, some do not want any immigration. This is not a new fight because Booker T. Washington was against immigration, arguing that immigration hurts black Americans economically, such as Trump saying black jobs. Washington publicly proclaimed his position in what came to be called the Atlanta Compromise Speech, his most acclaimed speech. He was the first African-American asked to address Southern planters at this economic exposition the purpose of which convincing Northern industrialist investors to provide Southern planters with capital. White Southerners, financially destroyed after the Civil War, desperately sought to convince Northern industrialists they were building a new South that included reliable labor from the formerly enslaved and that would be socially stable, thus a good investment. The organizers of the exposition viewed Washington as the perfect representative of this new South Given his advocacy of a non-confrontational approach to relations between African Americans and whites and of segregation, Washington has an interest in the negotiations because he wants the Southern planters to employ African Americans and not immigrants. Booker T. Washington, Atlanta Exposition Speech in Atlanta, Georgia, September 18, 1895. So, but I just feel like uh, my main thing was the immigration economy and the global uh aspect of it I, I do feel like won, I, what happened I, Calvin, I do to be feel a like there was now. a there was a lot of anti-immigration that went into how everybody voted oh i got a question about that Thank and you. he's right they're not living anymore he caused this inflation i gave him a country with no essentially no inflation it was perfect it was so good all he had to do is leave it alone he destroyed it with his green new scam and all of the other all this money that's being thrown out the window he caused inflation as sure as you're sitting there the fact is that his big kill on the black people 
is the millions of people that he's allowed to come in through the border. They're taking black jobs now, and it could be 18, it could be 19, and even 20 million people. They're taking black jobs, and they're taking... Oh, I got a question about that. Thank well, you for bringing that. What don't you like yeah. about immigration, my brother? So it's not a... Well, to me, it, it hinders black Americans when you have mass immigration and illegal immigration. But with the immigration thing, so with the illegal immigrants, so-called about to get deported or whatnot, for the people that did immigrate here, Im uh, migrate here the correct way, because like Cause they, because that's what they do. Immigrants have built this country. No, I know. No, they and, did and, not. Like anti-immigration goes way, no, they way did back. Not. Black it people goes way built back. This nation. Like even in the 1800s, we 1900s, was here. we was here. They always hated immigrants. They always blamed everything on immigrants. But America has needed immigrants. America is what it is because they keep bringing immigrants and, to this country. And this is, and this is, but we're not going to say immigrants built this country. They did they, not. They did. Okay. Can, can I say, can I, can I point out when we say that immigrants did not build this country? Immigrants did build this country hey, hey, because... Let him talk, let him talk bro. Oh, wait, 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 I don't know, wait, I don't know you, bro. Like, I, I don't know why you've been talking to me. But wait, well, what, wait, I, what wait, I'm trying wait, to say wait. is Slow immigrants down. build Relax. this country Relax. because Relax. a lot, a lot, the Irish, when they came, when they came in, the Italians, the the most of the most of most of the, the railroad tracks were built by Chinese immigrants who came who came here in the eighteen hundreds and the seventeen hundreds. So when 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 people say immigrants did not build this country, most of most of the United States were immigrants because Texas was part of Mexico in, until we got annexed by 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 America. The, the, the Louisiana Purchase, where where French was in Louisiana, those were immigrants. That's why they speak Creole. When when you go up when you go up to to Washington all those all those places were built by by immigrants so when when black people are saying well you know we are the foundation and we built everything it's like yes y'all built the majority of things but you cannot at the same point then push out all the all those other immigrants Nobody's who came out, in but here you, and say that they 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 they're not the they're not important. Because this no, country they, they, was built yeah. as a collective. Immigrants played a part in building the country. It was, it was built as a no. This uh, country is no, what it is no, because you because call, because you can't because they it. they brought immigrants here. When did the immigrants you cannot, come here? What do you mean immigrants? I mean, you, you, know immigrants. The, you know the Irish <laughs> were immigrants, right? The Italians <laughs> were immigrants. <laughs> the Chinese were immigrants. The huh? Like the, <laughs> everybody, everybody that came here besides the people that were brought here by slave ships mm -hmm. were immigrants. Wait, and this is all I'm gonna say is like. I've, I've, Calvin, I've heard you about the FBA thing, but obviously, ninety-three percent of women voted Democrat. Ninety-three percent of Black women. Yeah, yeah. Black of women. Black women, of course. <laughs> Our women. Eighty percent. Yeah, of Black Black men. women, and then eighty percent of Black women out of Black men voted Democrat. Mm -hmm. And like FBA, whatever, as a movement, like you guys, you guys are conservative. You guys, you guys need more people because. Majority of black those, people. Those people you just said. Those, those are ma majority of black people don't agree with you guys, and, but, and unless yeah, you're yeah, saying yeah, no, 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 but hold on, no, no, no. Hold on. Like I the reason, do. no, no. Let, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Point, let me finish. Point, point numbers. Let me finish. Uh -huh. Point numbers. Let me finish. The reason I'm saying that is because every I, I've reached out to every black person that I that I know, and like, like you guys are a minority, so I feel like this is a battle between FBA needs to fight with other black people be before you come at Africans because majority. Of black people. So is it three no, separate no, black people? No, no, no. About? Like a majority of black people, <laughs> majority of black people look at us as black. And and you guys are like, oh no, 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 no. And you guys want to be like, oh, we, we support Trump. Yeah, we you guys are minority. On the surface. Do you agree with that? Ethnically. You guys are minority. Black. Calvin. So, so what, Calvin, what do you call in, our culture? in your own community, you're a minority. American. Right? <laughs> that's what you are. No, that's a nationality. Yes, no, 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 no. American. Calvin. Calvin, Calvin. You're an American nationality. I'm saying like in your own community, you are a minority. No, I'm not. I'm yeah, you are. You and voted. You I, voted for Trump, right? How many black people? Uh, like, what percentage of black people voted on, for Trump? Hold on, and let, thirty percent of black men no, voted for Trump. No, okay. twenty. Less than twenty percent. Eighteen percent. Yes, I don't You're like, wrong. wrong. Like, You're wrong. Like, like, You're wrong. Hey, you're wrong. Here, Time okay. out. Hold on. Let's 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 like let's bring it this all the way back. <laughs> Okay. So, so like, so, so, so it's just, it's just, Willie, 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 to me, that's completely off <laughs> code for me. What's being so code I is? guess. Let me, let me say. It. The discussions about atonement for the enslavement of Black Americans has a long history in the United States. Most famously, General William T. Sherman drafted Special Field Order 15 in 1865. 
the order stipulated that Confederate land seized in Georgia and South Carolina would be split among formerly enslaved Black people in those states, no more than 40 acres per family. Black Americans commonly refer to this measure as 40 acres and mule, and it has become a long-standing symbol for both the promise of and pessimism about repayment for slavery, or reparations. Efforts toward reparations have continued into the 21st century. In 2021, Evanston, Illinois became the first U.S. city to create a reparations plan for its Black residents. And in 2022, Harvard University created a $100 million fund for Black students who are descendants of enslaved people. Given this enduring history, the survey asked Black Americans to share their views on the impact of slavery on their position in the United States, whether the descendants of enslaved Black people should be repaid for the labor of their ancestors, the forms of repayment that would be most helpful, the institutions or individuals who bear responsibility for repayment, and the likelihood that repayment would occur in their lifetime. The legacy of slavery affects Black Americans today. Chart showing majority of Black adults say the legacy of slavery affects the position of Black people in the U.S. Nearly 6 in 10 Black adults, 57%, say their ancestors were enslaved. This includes 41% who report their ancestors were enslaved in the U.S. and 5% who say they were enslaved outside the U.S., as well as another 11% who say their ancestors were enslaved both in the U.S. and in another country. However, not all Black Americans are certain whether their ancestors were enslaved and some indicate their ancestors were not enslaved at all. About one-third, 34%, say they are unsure if their ancestors were enslaved, while 8% say their ancestors were not enslaved, despite differences in their personal knowledge about the enslavement of their ancestors. A large majority of Black adults, 85%, say the legacy of slavery affects the position of Black people in the U.S. today. This includes 55% who say the legacy of slavery affects Black people a great deal, and 30% who say it affects them a fair amount. Much smaller shares of Black adults say the legacy of slavery does not have much, 9%, or any effect, 4%, on the position of Black people in the U.S. today. Among Black Americans, political party affiliation, educational attainment, and income are important points of difference in views on this question. The share of Black Democrats and Democratic leaners, 57%, who say the legacy of slavery affects Black people a great deal outpaces the share of Black Republicans and Republican leaners, 39%, who say the same. Black adults who identify as politically liberal, 64%, are more likely than those who identify as moderate, 51%, or conservative, 54%, to say the legacy of slavery affects the position of Black people a great deal. And Black adults who say they are registered to vote, 58%, are more likely than those who say they are not registered, 45%, to say the same. Black adults with a bachelor's degree or higher level of education, 61%, are more likely than those with a high school diploma or less, 48%, and those with some college education but no bachelor's degree, 56%, to say that the legacy of slavery affects the position of Black people a great deal, and Black adults with upper, 61%, and middle incomes, 57%, are more likely than those with lower incomes, 51%, to say this. There are also regional differences among Black adults on this question. Those who live in the Northeastern U.S., 62%, are more likely than those in the South, 53%, or the Midwest, 51%, to say the legacy of slavery affects Black people a great deal. But no matter which region of the country they are in, at least 7 in 10 Black adults say slavery's legacy affects Black people in the U.S. Today, at least a fair amount. Black adults do not differ by ethnicity or immigrant status on this issue. Non-Hispanic Black adults, 55%, are about as likely as multiracial, 50%, and Hispanic, 51% Black adults to say that the legacy of slavery affects Black people a great deal. Likewise, U.S.-born Black adults, 55%, are about as likely as black immigrants, 55%, to say this. Among the general public, only 28% say the legacy of slavery affects the position of black people in the U.S. today a great deal. Four in 10 U.S. adults, 40%, say the legacy of slavery has little to no effect on the position of black Americans in the country today. 
Most black adults agree the descendants of enslaved people should be repaid, showing black Democrats more likely than Republicans to think descendants of the enslaved should be repaid. A large majority of black adults, 77%, think the descendants of people enslaved in the U.S. should be repaid in some way, a view widely shared across many demographic subgroups of black Americans. Black adults' differences on this question fall primarily along the lines of political affiliation. Although the majority of black adults in both partisan coalitions think descendants of those enslaved in the U.S. should be repaid, Democrats, 81%, are more likely to hold this view than Republicans, 64%. Black liberals, 84%, and moderates, 79%, are more likely than conservatives, 71%, to say that descendants of the enslaved should be repaid. And black adults who say they are registered to vote, 80%, are more likely than those who report they are unregistered, 72%, to support reparations for slavery. Notably, large majorities of almost all these groups support reparations for the descendants of those enslaved in the U.S. Black adults' support for reparations also differs based on their views of identity and society. In the survey, Black adults were asked how important being Black was to how they think about themselves and also whether racist laws or racist individuals are a bigger problem for Black people in the U.S. today. Chart showing majority of Black adults think descendants of people enslaved in the U.S. should be repaid. Black adults who say that being Black is extremely or very important to their personal identity, 84%, are more likely to support reparations for slavery than those who say that being Black is somewhat, a little or not at all important to them, 58%. And Black adults who say racist laws are a bigger problem for Black people, 87%, are more likely than those who say racist individuals are the bigger problem, 72%, to support reparations, though large majorities of both groups still agree. While nearly three-quarters or more of Black adults across education and income levels support reparations, about one in five Black adults with a bachelor's degree, 21%, as well as black adults with middle, 21%, or upper incomes, 20%, do not think descendants of enslaved people should be repaid. The pattern of wide support for reparations among black adults is reversed when it comes to the general public. Just 30% of all U.S. adults say descendants of enslaved people should be repaid in some way, a much lower share than the 77% of black adults who say the same. In fact, Nearly 7 in 10 among the public overall, 68%, say descendants of people enslaved in the U.S. should not be repaid, compared with 17% of black adults who say the same. The types of repayment black adults think would be most helpful black adults who say descendants of enslaved people should be repaid were asked how helpful the following forms of repayment would be. Educational scholarships, financial assistance for starting or improving a business, financial assistance for buying or remodeling a home, and cash payments. Overall, about three-quarters or more of Black adults who support reparations say scholarships, 80%, and financial assistance for businesses, 77%, and for homes, 76%, would be extremely or very helpful for descendants of enslaved people. Fewer say the same about cash payments, 69%. Although majorities across most Black demographic groups say each of these forms of repayment would be extremely or very helpful, a few differences by age, education, and income stand out. Of those who support reparations, Black adults ages 65 and older, 85%, are slightly more likely than those 30 to 49, 78%, to say that educational scholarships would be extremely or very helpful. Black adults with a bachelor's degree or higher level of education, 83%, and those with some college education but no bachelor's degree, 82%, are more likely than those with a high school diploma or less, 75%, to say that scholarships would be extremely or very helpful. And Black adults with upper and middle incomes, both 84%, are more likely than those with lower incomes, 75%, to say this. Meanwhile, some black adults were more likely than others to say cash payments would be extremely or very helpful. Black adults with a high school diploma or less, 70%, as well as those with some college but no four-year degree, 73%, are more likely than those with a bachelor's degree, 62%, to say cash payments would be extremely or very helpful.
And the shares of Black adults with lower, 72%, and middle incomes, 68%, who say that cash payments would be extremely or very helpful are larger than the share of upper-income Black adults, 57%, who say the same. Bar chart showing. Black adults who want reparations differ by education and income on helpfulness of cash payments, regardless of how people feel the United States built its wealth from 500 years of free slave labor and it owes Black Americans a dose. The a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. At the turn of the 21st century, these were digitized by the Library of Congress with the help of the Citigroup Foundation. I have included a link to the digitized written accounts in the description of the video below. The following is a collection of the recordings of interviews with ex-slaves that were mostly made in the 1930s and 1940s. The My name is Houghton Hughes. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. And now I am 101 years old. They are voices that break a silence. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows. Witnesses to a time we only know from photographs and the written word. But they were there. He tell us to go on that picket fence all day long to the soldiers going back to silence home in different places. Colored soldiers. Colored soldiers in gold. Born to slavery. But we didn't have no property, we didn't have no home. And now we, we can hear them speak. Of course, you're nothing but a dog. Everything that's slave. They know nothing about reading right there. All that I know, they teach you to mind your master and your missus. Mom didn't know where to go. She had to feel good. Just, turn, just like he turned some mountain, you know, didn't know where to go. They are haunting voices from the past. Not actors reading a script or scholars reading a text, but the actual voices of men and women, Americans, who were born in slavery. My name is Houghton Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was a hundred and fifty. people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. He won't slip on the floor. Part of here, part of there. Just like a, a lot of uh, wild people, we didn't, we didn't know nothing. Didn't like looking no book. Women like Laura Smalley, describing the makeshift church where slaves worshipped on a big plantation in East Texas. All the chapel would have be a tub, tub of water sitting just like this thing is, you know, and that would catch your voice. And they would, they would have checks around that too, all of them get around the too. Or Harriet Smith, remembering what she saw as a small girl during the final days of the Civil War. The only reason why black Americans have not been paid reparations is because of racism. Some whites and other immigrant groups want to make black Americans a permanent underclass that is the structure of capitalism. They do not want to have black Americans on an even economic playing field. This is a war because black Americans are not backing down this time and are not going back to sleep. They want Reconstruction 2.0. They are will to steamroll over any group who gets in their way the same way them and their ancestors have been steamrolled. The world has been put on notice. In my opinion, the diaspora war is not going anywhere anytime some soon. The diaspora war is about power, and the African and Caribbeans want power in the United States but the black Americans have a strong advantage. It is their home and they have the numbers to vote into office persons who will fulfill their will. Let's look at the defeat of Kamala Harris. 15 million Democrats did not vote 7% of black American women voted for Trump and many more stayed home. And 21% of black American men voted for Trump and many more stayed home. Which is a stark contrast to the 95% black American vote the Democratic Party used to enjoy even when we look at how black Chicagoans have responded to South American immigrants, they formed Flip Chicago Red, and 37% of black Americans under the age of 54 in Chicago voted for Trump. People are beginning to realize that black America is as putting black Americans first, and they too want power. Wealth and economics, they are circling the wagons for their ethnicity. 
I am a humanitarian, but self-preservation is the first law of nature in the words of Chicagoan George Blakemore. I am Blakemore. I am not upset with anyone who puts themselves first. South African leader of the EF Julius Malema says he is for black South Africans first, then South Africa as a whole, then Africa, then the African diaspora. And I have never been upset with him for saying this. This has been The Awakening, Black Women United. I am your host, Sherry Danny. Subscribe, like, share, comment, and hit the notification bell 